if you can't hear me, please raise your hand. Does anybody get that? <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let me, uh, let me start off by saying that the title of this, uh, The Evolution of Network Thinking, is a little bit grandiose, just a bit. Uh, there are people who are in far better position than I am to be able to do that. That's why I call it a Molzai tour, of it, because I really came at this from a very different perspective. Because if you can read the fine print here, I'm actually an MD. And uh, we have no place in this world anymore. But at, <laughs> at the time, at the time that I did it, uh, or I started doing this sort of thing, uh, physicians actually were the ones who worked in public health and who did epidemiology. And so I entered the epidemiology area really through CDC. And some of you may be familiar with the EIS program, Epidemic Intelligence Service, which something of an oxymoron. But anyway, it was, uh, it was uh, through that that I got interested in epidemiology and I studied it more or less officially. And the part of it that I got interested in was what was called in those days VD, now called sexually transmitted disease, which is actually a better name because VD sort of hides it and it doesn't really say what's going on. So I got interested in that and there were, it turned out to be a uh, a treasure trove of information that people, data that people have been collecting for years, mostly at CDC, but also in state health departments, that provided an opportunity to use a lot of epidemiology. And it was through that that I kind of got interested in networks and how they occurred. So I just want to give that as background because that's why it's a mole's eye view tour. I mean, the, the mainstream was really very different. I want to begin by telling you my innate bias about all this. And I think what, what we saw this morning, what David presented, all the things that were done, is really the infrastructure for the following thought, that it's qualita quantitative methods that provide us with qualitative answers. And what I mean by qualitative in this sense is narrative, credible narrative about what's actually going on. So, you know, to reduce it to its minimum, what David was trying to do was show how behavior change and network change interact to produce what we see and perhaps explain it. Uh, that is a very simplistic way of looking at it, but what he will ultimately come up with is some sort of story about what actually happens. And this, this enormous amount of quantitation, this sophisticated and subtle approach and requires tremendous skill really forms a basis for these kinds of narrative statements that we can make. If you think about theory of evolution, for example, there's some very simple narrative statements that describe it, but then there's this huge amount of data that support it. And I think that's, that's sort of the orientation I have. So I'm going to try to get back to this thought at the end, if I can remember to do it. But anyway, it's a it's sort of the basis of what might be going on here. Well, to start with the starting point, there's a lot of debate about that. When did net network work really begin? And I vote for Leonard Euler and the Konigsberg Bridge. Has anybody ever heard of this? You have, okay, so you, you all know about it. But let, for those who haven't, let me just tell you that the good people of Konigsberg used to spend their Sunday afternoons on the bridges going back and forth. And they had, a, they had a, a problem. They wanted to start and end at the same place and cross each bridge only once without doubling back. And nobody could ever do it. And so the mayor of Konigsberg wrote to Leonard Euler, who was in St. Petersburg at the time, and said, could you help us with this? And um, Euler thought about it for a minute and said, no. <laughs> No, it's, it's not a mathematical problem. It's a little logical problem. So the mayor wrote back and he said, please. And so Euler said, okay, I'll take a look at it. And he came up with a very simple narrative that described why you can't do that. And it's worth looking up. I'm not gonna go into the details, but then he said, you know, there's something even more interesting here. There's something mathematical in here. And what he said was that if we take a look at these things, we've got We've got these bridges here. We've got this land mass in the middle of the river. And we've got these seven bridges. How can we actually construct a theory, a mathematical theory, which would allow us to prove or disprove the hypothesis? And what he did was, 
and this was the stroke of genius, was he said, let's make the land, oops, let's make the land masses, I get them here, nodes, and the bridges are edges. So that was, I think, the beginning of graph theory. And it's actually, you know, been developed to the nth degree since then. But this was his basic in, insight and his, um, and the origination of graph theory, I think, was part of what, um, what he contributed to the whole business. Well, actually, conventional network attribution is to this gentleman here, Juan Moreno, who is uh, actually Spanish by birth and who taught sociology at NYU in New York City. And he actually wrote a book that had network diagrams in it. And the book was about psychodrama. That is how people interact and setting up uh, artificial situations in which people would interact, but he drew them as nodes and edges. And so a lot of what's attributed then to the origination of network, um, network ideas was really from this. Now, what's interesting to me was that, well, no, let me get back to this. Um, this was, just to finish this idea of what the, uh, of what the or origin would be, this is a diagram that Lenton Freeman did himself, one of the giants <coughs> of network analysis. And it really shows the network of connections among the originators, among the progenitors of network ideas. And uh, again, if you look at this diagram carefully, you can pick out a lot of names that you probably heard. Well, as I was saying before, the, the thing that was interesting to me was that one year before Moreno published his book, a fellow named Munson, <clears throat> who was the uh, VD control officer in New York State, published this particular article on the epidemic, oops, excuse me. Um, let me get it right here on the epidemiology of syphilis and gonorrhea. And this was published in AJPH in 1933. And for those of you who haven't ever read the old literature, what you used to do is you would draw these things by hand, take a picture of them, send it to the developer, come back, and 10 days later you had a, something that you could send off to a magazine. And this is a good example of it, hand-drawn. And you can see in here that he's got initials of people and something about their date and what he did. So he really had the primordia of, um, of a true network of people who were involved in transmission of STD. But this is 1933. Four years later, a gentleman named Thomas Parron, who was then Sur Surgeon General of the United States, published a book called Shadow on the Land. And it was really the first, if you like, expose of syphilis. There was a lot of syphilis around. Physicians knew that, people who took care of patients knew that, but it generally wasn't talked about. And he brought it out into the open. And this was a great contribution from Thomas Parent. Now, subsequently, or actually contemporaneously, he also organized and ran and was part of the sort of directorate that ran the Tuskegee study. So he's been vilified more recently, and the prize an STD honor that's uh, given out was named for him, and that name was taken away and it was given some other silly name. And, uh, you know, that's a whole other argument as to what you do about things like that when you discover that the people that you are venerating, <laughs> as it were, are um, maybe flawed. But be that as it may, what he did was <clears throat> publish a book called Shadow on the Land, and this is one of the diagrams, which is also a network. Now, what do you notice about this network? Well, first of all, what you notice is that people have sex in a straight line. And if you are a commercial sex worker, AKA prostitute, then you stand with your arms akimbo and you wear a hat. But if you are a wife, oops, if you are a wife or a daughter, you stand with your arms at your side, you wear a long dress and you have a Shazam symbol. So the underlying theory of network transmission that's embodied in this is random association. And you get this kind of straight line effect 
you have sort of random choice of partners and they have random choice of partners and there's no feedback. There's nothing that goes from say this person here back to this initial case. So you don't see those connections. Now clearly what we were all ingesting this morning was how important those connections are. Those are the most, most important thing. And this is, I think, very clearly not a very good way of depicting the way sexually transmitted diseases would occur. But it was the founding document for the STD control program in the United States. The war intervened, and then in the late 1940s, a Bureau of Venereal Disease was formed. It was part of the CDC. It later turned into a branch and then a division. And the CDC has changed its name a million times since then. But it became part and parcel of what the CDC does. And they send people out in the field. They interview people with disease. At that time, it was mostly syphilis. And they get their contacts and they test the contact. Excuse me. They test the contacts. And they try to figure out what's going on with this. So what really was happening then was a parallel kind of universe. Here we have the mainstream. This is what was really going on with social networks. Moreno and then graph theory ultimately with Erdo and Rennie and Rob Port and Frank and a whole bunch of other famous names. Sociologic theory, mathematical development, and in the 80s HIV and in the 90s statistical physics became involved in it. And in the 2000s, we suddenly were inundated with social media, big data, the weaponization of, of networks, as it were, and then network modeling, which is what we're talking about this morning. Now, the little tributary of this, not the mainstream, but the, even a rivulet was, oops, I keep hitting the wrong button, was begun with Munson and Perrin, and then people were doing all this interviewing. And one of the public health advisors, a fellow named Russ Havlat, said, you know, if I interview this guy and he names patient A or contact A, I interview this guy and this guy also names contact A, let's put him in the same folder. And there was a network. And so without really knowing anything about what this half of the world was doing, these folks then began to develop what they called the lot system. Now the term lot, is interesting. It doesn't come from Lot's wife. This was not Sodom and Gomorrah. This was actually what pharmaceutical companies do. They, they send you drugs in lots. And so on, on any kind of um, medicine that you see there, you'll see a lot number. So what he really was thinking of was that we put a number on this group and we have different lots and they're connected. And that will give us an opportunity to see how the connections work and it was developed to a fair extent, but not in a way that these folks ever knew about these folks or vice versa. Well, this is a part of it that I was involved with, and that's why I call it a mole's eye view, because it was very much separated and different from the way the major part of network analysis was going. What happened, actually, though, was that here we have the mainstream, and here we have this little tributary, and they both met at AIDS. And that's where I think the two things came together. Just to go back to the last slide, what happened was that a fellow named uh, David Auerbach published with, with uh, uh, Jim Curran uh, and Bill Darrow, he published an article in 1981 that looked at a bicoastal epidemic of men who were terribly sick with some sort of immune disease and they had 44 cases. And this was the first publication. I'll show you that diagram in just a minute. And then in 1985, uh, Al Klovdal, who is uh, American living in Australia and is still there, actually did a network type analysis. He was one of the early network analysts. And he did a network type analysis, which purported to show, I think fairly convincingly, that it was a multifocal epidemic. It was not, in fact, a single source. Well, from 1988 on, suddenly there was a tremendous amount of data available, and studies of STD and HIV and empirical work were, were possible at this point. So after they met at AIDS, this diagram was looked at again 
as I say, by Al Clovedal and others. And you can see that it actually has a fair bit of information. But what I like about it is how much it looks, except it's better drawn, how much it looks like Munson's original diagram. You know, you've got, you've got names in here, you've got some numbers, you've got places. And <clears throat> the idea was to say that there was this connection. What Auerbach's article did was to say that the likelihood of this connection based on probabilities that having these 44 men from both coasts and places in between know each other and had sex with each other would seem to be extremely rare. And that really provided the, the notion that this was a transmissible disease. You may not remember, but when HIV was first described, it was not considered a transmissible disease. It was thought to be a miasma or some other some other crazy thing. But what, what these guys did really was to show that this had to have been a transmissible agent. It was around 1985 that HTLV3 was first described and then became known as HIV. Well, to go back to the lot system then, I mentioned that after 1988, a lot of data were available. And these data came mostly from health departments. So this is an example of a lot, lot 004, that was identified through contact tracing for gonorrhea in Colorado Springs in 1981. And the person who did this was a fellow named John Potterat, who um, was actually a public health advisor, then had moved to Colorado Springs to live there, took over their STD program. And I met him around that time, and he said that what he wanted to do is he wanted to view, interview everybody with gonorrhea for a six month period and get all their contacts. And he did it. He interviewed almost a thousand people. It was an incredible job of work. But what they found was that using this lot system, they could develop a group of people here who are all connected. And then that kept adding on and adding on and adding on. When it got up to here, they began to have cases of gonorrhea and these are the cases in dark of gonorrhea. Notice this is also hand-drawn. It's a long time ago. <clears throat> and these are the cases of gonorrhea. And this is the lot. And this is how many people were in it. And this is where he stopped having to do it. So this, this last bit here is artificial. It's not, a, it's not a real phenomenon. Well, this is, again, a primordium of some sort of network. 20 years later, we looked at the same data that was still available on cards. You know, this is primitive stuff. Still available on cards and found that we could reprogram it. And this is what that network looked like. Now, strangely enough, people did have sex in a straight line. That this turned out to be a group of people who were very active, but who constantly were changing partners. And there was very little a reversion back to other people. There was a little bit of a separate group that we hadn't noticed before, but the main part of the group just moved forward and there was transmission within that group. Now, one of the things that came out about this then is that this type of structure, which we could call dendritic, actually doesn't lend itself to a lot of transmission. That one has to have reversion, one has to have people going back and forming what you might call network structures to be able to get much more, uh, or to be able to get more of the kind of transmission that I think we see. So this was a very interesting thing where that initial lot could actually be turned into a network. And part of the reason that it wasn't earlier on, I had to do with a lot of software. And the software has developed enormously since then, as I think everybody's aware. Okay, well, to me, the primary problem in network analysis, or one of the primary ones, is this connection of micro and macro. And this was first mentioned by Mark Ranavetter at Harvard in 1973 in what is probably one of the best known articles in network analysis called The Strength of Weak Ties. Now, th this notion of weak ties, he defined very carefully. And it's, again, a term that has been used in a whole variety of different ways since. But the way he defined it was that if I know you, it's a weak tie. If we both know somebody else, it's a strong tie. It's a rather simplistic way of thinking about it, but that's 
That's basically what he said. <clears throat> so what he was saying was strength of weak ties is very important. How well you know your postman or your barber. Those are weak ties, uh, but they can have an enormous impact. And I just read an article, you know, one of the, uh, one of the things online that I saw that talked about how people can use their weak ties, that is, people at the periphery of their social network, say on Facebook, to help themselves in a variety of different ways. And the particular, the particular thing they talked about was getting a job. So this, they described this one person who just posted on his Facebook page, said that he was suddenly unemployed and he was looking for a job and here's where his skills were. And he had lots of people connected to him. And sure enough, somebody from way away whom he didn't really know, even though that person is called a friend on, <laughs> on uh, Facebook, somebody he didn't know got in touch with him and said, you know, we're looking for somebody with your skills. And he got a job. So that, that's the idea of what happens here. But the main thing that Granovetta said, aside from describing these weak ties, was that a fundamental weakness of current sociologic theory is that it does not relate micro-level interactions to macro-level patterns in a convincing way. And how the interactions in small groups aggregate to form large-scale patterns eludes us. What he proposed was that agglomerations of networks are the way we will be able to figure this out. And I think to some extent, this has actually held up pretty well. Well, Virginia Morris wrote in 2005, oh, excuse me, 2003, she wrote that local rules, meaning choices made by people at risk and the specific things that they do will generate the global properties of networks. And that's a quote from that article. And what she was saying there was that you as an individual can pick partners. You can pick what you do with those partners. You can pick how long you stay with them. But you really don't pick anything else. You're just doing this for yourself. However, those partners do other things. And there are other things with other people. And other people do other things. And that's what forms the global network structure. Now, <clears throat> a couple of years later, uh, Gary Robbins, Pat Patterson, enlarged on this idea. And I love this phrase, actors do not usually cast their gaze across the entire network, which is a great way of saying it. Possibly because in most cases, they can only see what's in their local social neighborhood. So on the basis of the localized view, they form strategies, make decisions, etc. Combinations of these competing or complementary intentions and actions constitute the social processes that make up local patterns of relationships and they agglomerate to form the global structure. And this, this again, starts with Granovetter's idea and uh, 30 years later puts it into some sort of form that's actually testable and can be looked at. And an awful lot of the work that's been done subsequently has been the testing of this idea. So where this led at the time, though, uh, that is jumping back and forth a bit in time, was that if we have a set of behaviors and a set of network relationships, just the sort of thing that it was talking about this morning, and a group of people between and among whom diseases are transmitted, can we account for the observed epidemic and endemic spread? So this is that, so, excuse me, that sort of portion of the whole network idea that I got interested in, and it is only a portion. It's not it's not the main thing that people have done. But what we're talking about then is the micro stuff leading to the macro stuff and seeing how those micro events ultimately lead to propagation. We know how diseases are transmitted. We understand the biology and the physiology of those transmissions, but how are they propagated? This is a totally different question. Well, the theory that was developed <clears throat> fairly early on in this was called the core group concept. Now, have people heard of this? Is that something that you're familiar with? Well, it's something that everybody in STD knows about because it's been around now for a long time. And it was the work of James York, Jim York and Herb Hethcote and Annette Nold. And the three of them worked on this in the 70s and 80s. <clears throat> 
And the reason that they did was that the STD division, that was then called, still called the VD division, created a contract with them. And the question that they were trying to answer was, did the gonorrhea screening program, which was begun in 1969, did that have an influence on gonorrhea transmission? Now, this particular diagram was one that was hand-drawn by Jim York, and it was part of the report that he made on the basis of the contract. And really, when he was looking at it, he said, well, here's 62, here's 75. Doesn't seem to be any effect at all. Well, he said, that's OK. But like Leonard Euler many, many years before, he said, there's actually a more interesting question here. In 1976, when they were consulting, they examined the contact tracing data. And they found that three infected persons, on average, infected one other person. And that's the R0, which I think you all have been talking about, was 0.33, which means that gonorrhea should have died out long ago. But it obviously didn't. In fact, this only goes to 2000, <clears throat> but you can see this, well, should I call it exponential? That's a loose talk. But anyway, it's an exponential rise in gonorrhea during the early part of the, late part of the 60s and early part of the 70s. And you know, people had all sorts of fanciful reasons for why this occurred, mostly flower children and stuff like that. But you know, I'm not so convinced. But in any event, one can also see in this, just as an aside, that it stayed stable for a long time, and then around 1981, it plummeted. And of course, that was the advent of HIV, and people changed their behavior substantially. So that affected gonorrhea transmission. But gonorrhea wasn't disappearing in 1975 at the time that they looked at this. So they concluded, and this is very simple logic, again like Euler, that for gonorrhea to propagate, there must be some areas of intense transmission <clears throat> and areas of very little transmission or none, terminal cases, and that the observed R0 is a weighted average of many areas with low transmission and a few areas of intense transmission. That was their hypothesis. And here's an example of it. Just, again, very simple example. If 4% of all areas account for most or all of cases, directly or indirectly, the overall R0 would be, R0 is the, the proportion, which have an R0 of 1, and the proportion here, 2, that had the other R0. And when you look at the actual numbers, 96% of places transmit at an R0 of 0.22, which is five cases generate one case. And 4% have an R0 of 3, which is one case generates three new cases. And when you average them, you get amazing, 0.33. Of course, I made the numbers up. But, but this is the idea. This is, this is what they were trying to say. So to do this, they postulated then that there exists groups that are less than 5% of the gonorrhea transmitters. And they designated them core groups and attributed them to them the following characteristics. They were heterogeneous groups of people. That is, they were different types of people. They had definable demographic and behavioral characteristics. They had frequent sexual contact, which gives you the potential for transmission. They were bounded socially and or geographically. And they were stable in the long or intermediate term. So that's their initial definition of what a core group was. I think we might even venture to say that a core group is a network. But that's not what they were thinking about right at that time. They said that they were not <clears throat> transient characteristics. That, for example, if someone's in contact with a case doesn't necessarily mean that they're in a core group. Casual sexu sexual partners may not be in a core group. And they were not homogeneous, disconnected groups of people, like, for example, commercial sex workers or 19-year-old boys or other groups of that sort, the kind of people that we put into compartments or boxes. Well, their major contributions then <clears throat> were in 78 and then 
This is still worth reading, Gonorrhea Transmission Dynamics and Control from 1984. It's really a seminal work on this. And what they actually did was say, sure, these are heterogeneous groups of people, but we're going to analyze this from a, from a compartment point of view. And they developed actually uh, some of the um, solutions to partial differential equations that have been used in uh, compartment type of analysis since then. OK, well, that's sort of confusing then. What really is a core group? Is it actually a compartment? Because that's what they did. Or is it really some other group? In 1996, Jim Thomas and Myra Tucker wrote an article wherein they looked at everybody who used the term core group. And they found, and I'm not going to read all these to you, they found a lot of variability, let's say. Prevalence of 20%, prostitutes, person who has sexual contact, very sexually active women and men, sex tracks at a source of more than 50% of reported cases, gonorrhea transmitters, people repeated, and so on. You can just, you know, lots of different definitions. I think they ended up with something like 20 different definitions of core group, which means that the term was really catchy and very popular, and people really loved that term, but they had no idea what it meant. And by the time they got through all of this, they were using it in any which way. Now, my thought is that there are actually two ways in which they were using it, both of which actually are valid in some ways. There are core compartments, and then there are core networks. And the compartments are defined by some sort of behavior or sociodemographics. For example, IDUs or commercial sex workers or 24-year-old male drug dealers, I mean, any group of people that you can define in a certain way. They are homogeneous, but not necessarily connected. So there really is something called a core person. And they are ascertained through either traditional or targeted sampling. And they're studied mostly with risk factor epidemiology and looking at mixing patterns and some compartment modeling. Now, on the other side are core networks, which demonstrate or display social, temporal, or geographic cohesion. And these could be areas, and I, I'm, I'm going to Atlanta now, but the West Side is of code 30318. It's a major um, uh, heroin area in the city at the time. Smith Street was another one. They're heterogeneous, but they're tied together by connections to each other. So there's really no core person, but there's a core area. And they are ascertained through network sampling methods, which as we all know are imperfect, and through ethnography. And they are then subject then to network analysis, visualization, ethnographic understanding. But what's important is that you can do modeling on the other side. So that's why I think this is, you know, the different definitions that people sort of cast around for. This probably represents much more of what York and Hethcote and Old were actually talking about. But be that as it may, this is an important way of thinking about it as well. One can do it either way. What we've come down to in terms of what networks look like, and I hope there are some strong voices around who might contradict this, but it seems to me that there are two major types of networks with STD transmission, HIV transmission, that have sort of evolved. One is the so-called power loss construct, where you have some nodes that are very active and many nodes that are not very active. And the number of very active nodes actually exceeds that which one would expect from some sort of distribution. And so here it is, and we can say then that what we have is a long tail to the right, which uh, has been generally called a power law distribution, although there is an interesting article from the group in Washington which says, you know, that's not really the best way to think about it because there are a number of different types of statistical models that can explain that long tail to the right. And they go into some detail about that. So whether or not it really is a power law is still debatable, but it's something that, that I think has sort of become ingrained in the literature. And this is something that I published a long, long time ago, but when you then plot the cumulative probability distribution for the log of the number of partners against the log of this cumulative probability distribution, you get a straight line, which is what defines that power law type of distribution. So this is one example of the way 
diseases may be transmitted. The other is the low degree high concurrency construct. And this just says that people are very, very intimately attached to each other, that there are lots of connections. It's sort of a simple way, again, of thinking about it, but there are just lots of connections in here. And the example that came up was the Lycoma study by Helleringer and Kohler. And what you can see here is you can see the um, bicomponents and how these were um, highly connected individuals the maximum number of partners that anybody had was seven. And so they were relatively low degree, but highly interconnected group. Okay, well with those two, what does it mean to do that? And um, here is a diagram that was made by somebody named James Moody many years ago. And uh, I nominate this to be a member of the network diagram pantheon, because this is just such a great, a great example. Now, this was not published in this form. It was published in a little bit different form. <clears throat> in the textbook uh, of sexually transmitted diseases. But what he's saying here is, maybe I should let him say it. Should I say it or should you? <laughs> well, correct me if I say it wrong. What he's looking at is here the average number of contacts. So people could have no more than three. That's all you're allowed. And again, it's a simulation, so he can make it anything he wants, right? So no more than three contacts. Most people had one or two, and a few had three. And the average number of contacts was 1.68, and this is what the network looks like after a lot of simulation. Here we go up to 1.74. You can see connections are beginning. 1.80, hmm, you've got a bicomponent in there now. And 1.87, and you've got should I say it, what my friend called a snot ball. You know, just this huge interaction. And we've moved from 1.68 to 1.87. That's 0 0.2, 0 0.19 uh, increase. Minuscule, one would think. Increase in the average number of partners to go from a diagram that looks like this to a diagram that looks like that. That gives such credibility to the notion that a small increase in the number of partners will create an environment, and one can think of this as an environment, for enormous amount of transmission that may occur. And again, he's got a lot of other stuff that he did in it, which I won't go into, but, but I think that this is just such an admirable demonstration. And this is, in my mind, what models are for. And there are several others like this that um, take a simple idea and demonstrate exactly what's going on with those ideas. One I'm not going to talk about, but if you would look it up, the watts strogatz model from 1999 is another example of this really beautiful way of thinking about something that bears no relationship to all the stuff going on on the ground, but really demonstrates what's happening. OK, well, since we're talking about models, let's think about how we can use this kind of information to develop an understanding of why there is such an intractable problem with STD and HIV transmission in local communities, certain communities that are mostly very disadvantaged, mostly minority communities. Why is this occurring? And I call it endemic because we're not, you know, we just say loosely the HIV epidemic, but we're not, we don't any longer have an epidemic. We have an endemic settled in situation, at least here in the United States, and actually in most parts of Africa as well. Although there are occasional bursts of activity, we're really in an endemic phase. So what maintains that? Why do we still have that? And to go back to what we are talking about was local choices generate global network properties like degree distribution and giant component and cohesion and concurrency and all those other things that we've talked about in, this, uh, in the workshop. But the sense that I had was that there's something more going on than just the networks. That the geography of these places must play, may play a very important role. And the compactness, stability, and correlation, autocorrelation, and perfectly personal geographic range may be a very important part of this. And in addition, something that one might call compound risk, which is multiple hits, as it were, on individuals 
through multiple sources and in multiple ways. So people who have this compound risk are at much greater risk of developing disease. And if this compound risk is occurring in the communities, it's not just risk taking, but if this compound risk is occurring in the communities, it may be a very important part of the transmission. So we were looking at network, geog geography, and risk. And these are the things that might produce endemic propagation. And this is just a simpler model without all the words, just to show how these things might interact. So first published this idea of in the mid to, well, about in 2006, but it was made up from a number of different studies. And it was just more hypothesis. So we were able then to, to do a follow-up study in, <clears throat> in Atlanta. And these are the zip codes in Atlanta. And these are the ones of very high prevalence. These are lesser prevalence. And this is lower prevalence. But what we're talking about is a prevalence of 10 versus 20%. I mean, these are all areas at risk. But there's one that's higher, and there's a group that's lower. And so what we tried to do was compare these two groups. Now, the, the groups here, the groups here were sought in the same way. And in each one of these zip codes, what we tried to do was find three seeds whom we would interview, three people whom we would interview, and we had for each one of those persons, we had two waves that we would interview. And so it was a designed study. And that gave us 15 and 15, or a total of 30 networks, which varied in size from 200 to 600, depending on how many people were there. And I can tell you ahead of time, prevalence in that group, in the groups that we interviewed, in this area was 12%, and this area was 19%. Not a huge difference, but you know, a lot of different cases, a lot of cases that would make up that difference. So there was a much bigger burden. OK, so let's look at compound risk in this group. We defined compound risk, and there were a total of almost 900 people who were interviewed as part of this study in those 30 groups. Uh, we said that the Compound risk should consist of one or more, of two or more of these six ways of getting HIV. Ten or more total sex partners, six or more male sex partners, ever injected drugs, ever engaged in sex work, ever had sex with an in, uh, IDU in the lifetime, and anal sex in the past six months. Now, it could be better defined, but this was just sort of a cut in trying to look at the data. And these are the frequencies of people with zero to six. Nobody had six of these. That's because nobody is both male and female. But uh, there were 25% who had one, and then a much smaller percentage overall that amounted to about 10% who had, <coughs> excuse me, who had two or more of these, of these risks. And when we looked at the lower risk area, we found that the percentage of people with two or more major risks was 5.7, and in the higher risk area is 15.5. So that makes a case for the idea that compound risk may be a factor. Now, some of you may well ask, where's the p-value? Now, why aren't there p-values here? That's a whole different story. You've got to read the current journal of, journal of the American Statistical Association. There are 43 articles that are in there published about why p-values really don't tell you the story. There actually is a very significant p-value associated with it. I don't want to show it because I don't want it to pretend to be something that it isn't. Remember, this is network sampling. This is not random sampling. This is also a group of people about whom we know a great deal, but about whom we don't know a great deal. So the so-called unmeasured covariates are probably there and are probably doing something. So I don't want to overdo it. But just to point out that it, at least it gives you some sense that the hypothesis may actually, may actually be meaningful. Well, how about geographic proximity? What we did was the relationship of social distance to geodesic distance. And you get a very nice matrix of this where you can then look at people who are two steps apart, three steps apart, four, five, and so forth, and then 10 steps apart. 
And the n by n squares contain all of the di all of the dyads within those boundaries. So what happens to geodesic versus social distance? When you look at those two together, and these are the proportion of people in the higher and the proportion of people in the lower. And you can see that the proportion of people who are the proportion of dyads that are in the upper distances is much greater than the ones in the <clears throat> in the uh, lower. So that the higher group of people actually had a much greater number of dyads enclosed at each distance point. When you look at the distribution of geographic distances, very many more of these people had, and this is uh, over all social uh, contacts, very many more of these people had a large or a very short um, geode geodesic distance compared to the social distance overall. So this gives some credibility to the idea that the distance from, of people from the people with whom they have contact makes a difference. And people who are in the lower risk group have a longer distance from the people with whom they have contact. Another way of looking at this was to look at the 30 groups from the point of view of polygon overlap. Now, what I mean by that is that from each individual, because we had 12 or 15 data points from each person as to where they went, where they went shopping, where they went for food, where they went to have sex, where they went to get drugs, you could then form a polygon around each person. And you could then look at all the people who are in a particular, one of the 30 particular networks, and you could see how they overlap. And so here are five people, and this is the overlap of all five. So what we did was look at 50% of the overlap, those that had 50% of the overlap. This is what that kind of a diagram would look like. It uh, doesn't come up very red here, but the red circles represent areas of uh, what we call centers of activity. It turned out to be a very good phrase because we tried to ask people, where do you hang out most of the time? And where do you spend your time during the day? And we used the phrase center of activity, and people got that right away, which was lucky because we didn't know what the phrase would be. But anyway, these are the centers of activity. And you can see that there are a few and that they are closely congregated and that they are part of where there is major overlap. So this is the typical overlap that we would see. And this is the overlap. The overlap among lower prevalence people was much less than the overlap among higher prevalence people. So what one gets then is a picture, again, without p values, a picture of groups of people that are very tightly connected socially and very tightly connected uh, geographically. And the hypothesis that we had behind this was that if you're in one of these kinds of areas, the next person you meet is somebody who has a high prevalence of STD or HIV and whom you are probably already connected to, even if you don't know it. And that idea then would be why continued propagation occurs. So the third part of this would have been the social networks and the attributes. And just glance over this. These are the number of nodes and number of ties, number of components, largest size component. The lower risk in general is a little bit lower than the higher risk. But boy, I'm having trouble with this diagram saying that there's a huge difference between them. If you look, for example, at mean concurrency, 7.0 versus 7.1, that's using the uh, um, Morris Kretschmer kappa that you can calculate from the mean <coughs> and standard deviation of the degree. So these things are really very close. Between this is average distance between nodes is close and distance in social terms. Uh, the diameters are very close. Point connectivity, which is when how many, how many um, on average, how many nodes you need to remove to separate two people. And they were almost identical. And that's good measure of connectivity. So here we have an interesting situation. These networks are not terribly different. And when you look at the power curve, so-called power curve, they virtually overlap. So the low risk and high risk have 
almost the same kind of structure in terms of the degree distribution. Well, if, if I were a crazy person, I would say networks don't matter. But I'm not a crazy person. I think they matter, <laughs> they matter a great deal. But the way they matter is different from what we thought it would be. With perhaps the way they matter is that you need this as a substrate. You need to have a certain kind of structure in place, but that the set point for prevalence will be determined by other things that may be going on in the network, like geography and compound risk. And that's, again, a hypothesis. I'm not, I'm not trying to uh, say that that's the truth, but, but that's the idea that you might get there. So the question then arises, if that's the case, then how are those networks different? Are they in some way that we've missed somehow? So, oh, excuse me. So when we have compound risk present, ge geographic proximity present, but not quite sure why the global network attributes are not so different, maybe we ought to look elsewhere. And the elsewhere that I thought might be interesting to look, and we're sort of in the process of doing this now, is at this person or group of people over here. Now, epidemiologists in general don't care about C. This is the person who is exposed and has the outcome. This is a person who has the outcome but is not exposed, and those are the two people you want to compare. These are the uh, people who are ignored completely, and these are people are people who <clears throat> don't have the outcome but they're exposed. And we can think of exposure as being in the high-risk area. So why do people who are in a high-risk area not get the disease? What is it about them that may be different from the people who do? That may not be amenable to a lot of different ways in which we usually look at things. So try to get at a way in which we could perhaps study this that involved the network itself. Call this the complement of risk. And you can see that in the area that we were studying that there actually are substantial numbers of people who do not have the adverse social consequences of living in those areas. 93% of teenage girls don't get pregnant. And 54% of adults are, in, are, are employed, actually. And 83% of high school students do not smoke, and so forth. Now, there are some bad, bad things here. 25% of households have a, um, don't have two parents. And that's one of the things that happens in these neighborhoods. But Overall, in these highest risk areas, about 92% of people did not have HIV. So what can we do to take a look at that? Well, here's one of these areas. It's area actually group 14. And the colors, again, don't come out very well, but the red folks, the ones, the nodes in red, are what we call core, and the nodes in this other color, whatever it is, what we call periphery. So I'm borrowing, going back to that terminology, core and periphery, which has been part of the network literature for decades, but used very differently from the way I'm using it. So please pardon me. This is not the way core and periphery is usually used. The way we define it here is that a core person, again, is someone who either has HIV or does not, but is directly connected one step away from someone with HIV. Those would be people who would be core by this definition. So, just suspend this belief for a minute. And we define periphery as persons who are at least two steps away from those with HIV. And that's basically everybody else in the network. So this is a completely connected component because it was designed that way. And these people are in this risk area, but they don't have HIV and they're actually fairly far from it. So what about them? Those are the C that we're talking about. So. What we wanted to do initially was determine whether position, that is core or periphery, is as or more important than area, higher or lower risk. Now, the study was extensive. There were about 350, 340, 50, 350 variables that describe respondents, people we interviewed, contacts, people they named, and the dynamic relationships. Now, we had enough information on 871 of the 894 people to be able to do this, they were interviewed, and many of them were also named as contacts. So people we interviewed were also named as contacts. And we could then say that 88 of these people were core, and 783 were peripheral. 
So we had a lot of information then on 871 people as to whether they were core or peripheral. And we did, we used the odds ratio as a kind of a screening tool in a simple logistic framework. The log of the variable over one minus the variable, we just converted everything to a dichotomous variable, was a function of area, position, and gender. Now, this is not meant to provide odds ratios as relative risks the way we usually use them. This is meant as a screening, a way of screening for these things. So we can screen a large number of variables to determine whether area or position or gender has the greatest effect on whether or not they are core periphery. And this is unreadable. So let's, let's take a look at the critical distinctions. Now, actually, I just put this up here just to show that we looked at a lot of stuff. And what we found was that the relative effect of area and position, the area is, excuse me, area is in blue, or approximately blue. And here, in these things, area was more important than position. So being in a high-risk area was more important than core. But you notice that being in the core was actually very important, too. And this was where you ever injected a drug, used heroin, had hep C, homeless, syphilis, unemployed, or ever diagnosed with TB. So those are the ones that were more important from the perspective of what's high. But notice that each one of these also was fairly important from the core perspective. And then where core was much more important than area is that if you were ever incarcerated or detained, being in the core was much more important than the area you were in. Current sex partners inject drugs, ever use crack? Any sex partners ever inject drugs? Whether they walk, which turned out to be a very interesting phenomenon because we were talking about geographic proximity and being enclosed in a space. People have no method of transportation. And if you know Atlanta, you understand why. And so there is no way of getting around. And people have to walk. And that turned out to be an important factor. There was an odds ratio of over two. They did, however, take MARTA bus more frequently, and they also smoked more frequently. So this was the constellation of people where core was more important than uh, area. And this is just goes through the modes of transportation, again, just to show you that walking was much more important than driving himself. And this is where, actually, the gender became most important. Women, it turns out, were more able to drive themselves or be driven by a friend or take a cab uh, or use other convenience, conveyances, excuse me, so that women were more mobile, interestingly. But for the most part, the women's effect on all of this was much smaller than the effect of either core, periphery, or of higher and lower. Well, let's turn this around and take a look at it from the perspective of this peripheral person, the person whom I've designated C. And you can see that here, this is on a log scale, so the odds ratios are even on both sides, that the uh, protective effect against incarceration was extremely strong. Now, we're not considering the area right now. This is just core versus periphery that it was extremely strong versus people in the core. Current sex partners injected drugs they were protected from and so forth. These are all protected. This is 0.5. You can see the protection against walking, protection against syphilis, protection against being homeless or injecting drugs. That's where these people are. They are part of this environment, but these are the characteristics that these folks have who are further and more distant, or in general more distant from HIV. On the other side of this, where they have a, a positive or a, an OR that's greater than one, is that they felt they were in excellent health. They drove. They had an income with a paying job. They were largely heterosexual. They had been, interestingly, more diagnosed with chlamydia than either gonorrhea or syphilis, and they completed the eighth grade. Most of these folks had not completed the eighth grade, most of the people that we were dealing with. So 
If we're comparing core and peripheral persons, just to summarize it, the peripheral person is much less likely to have been incarcerated to use heroin or cocaine, ever injected a drug, ever had an injecting sex partners, been homeless, or to walk as their primary mode of transport, where they're more likely to be good in health, thrive, a paying job, be heterosexual, chlamydia, and eighth grade, as I mentioned earlier. Very clear distinction between core and periphery persons. So some tentative conclusions are, not to take it too far, but there are observable differences in persons who occupy different positions in the network. And this is where the C is, and it seems to me that that's the part of the network we haven't focused on very much, but that may mean a great deal in terms of where transmission occurs. Oops, did it again. For some of these differences, position is even more important than the risk area of residence, which is interesting because if you're living in that area and you are a core person, you are at very great risk. If you remember that logistic equation, if you just add together the appropriately, you add together the, um, uh, the coefficients, you can then fill out A, B, C, and D for the odds ratios associated with all four of those. And what you find is a gradient, very impressive gradient. I didn't bring those numbers along, but there's a very impressive gradient then as you go from A to D. And uh, in terms of, uh, for example, heroin use, injection use, uh, the likelihood if you are in the core and in a high risk area <clears throat> of injecting is 98 times that of being in the periphery in the low risk. That's just using the equation that way if you're allowed to, which I think you are, but you know, don't take it, you don't take it too seriously. And then for some characteristics, being female was more important, but these were probably not the major characteristics that involved transmission. Okay, well, the qualitative story that comes out of out of this kind of quantitative work is that the nature of the person, the actual characteristics of the person, something that is difficult to uh, catch because it's so voluminous, may really be the telling part of what happens within networks. Now, I don't want to go too far with that because, you know, again, it's difficult to, to say, but that, that's the qualitative story, the narrative that emerges out of something of this sort. And just to get even more speculative with you, I wanted to talk a little bit about these neighborhoods and what goes on with them. The term syndemic um, was uh, first used in the 1990s to describe multiple epidemics that are occurring at the same time. And the people with whom we were talking, the people who we interviewed, the people we dealt with, the neighborhoods we worked in, all were concentrated, concentrating mechanism for all of the things that you see on this slide, from crime, racism, poverty, violence, joblessness, to withdrawal of infrastructure, non-functional public education, which is rampant in, in Georgia, and vaccine-preventable diseases, STDs, of course, HIV and substance abuse is the big ones. So we're dealing with neighborhoods that are highly disadvantaged and at great risk. And is there a way we can generalize from the little that we're beginning to learn about STDs and HIV? And what made me think of this was, I mentioned at the beginning that I'm actually a doctor. And uh, it made me think of a clinical syndrome called the locked-in syndrome. Has anybody ever heard of that? You know what that is? the butterfly and the diving bell. It's, it's a very interesting idea. Uh, it, well, it's a, it's a terrible thing to have happen, but it involves a stroke in the brain, in the midbrain, a part of the midbrain called the pons. So it's a pontine stroke. It leaves a person totally paralyzed. They cannot move a muscle except for their eyes. They can blink. And the book I just referred to was written by a man who was locked in and he dictated the book with his eyes. Well, this locked-in syndrome has an analogy. It's a metaphor for what may be going on. Here are those zip codes, again, for Atlanta. 
and I did it again. And, and what we have here is we have things that lock in people who are there, economic, physical, cultural, educational, environmental, and social barriers that are there. And within these areas then, we find that confluence of adverse events, adverse, adverse effects, you might say, of these social barriers, the glass walls of geographic Im immobility. I mean, this is not a glass ceiling, these are walls. People can't get out, they don't have the wherewithal to drive, they don't have the way of walking out. And besides, they have lived in these neighborhoods most of their lives. Now, the size and shape of this neighborhood can vary. It can be very small with a big peak like this, or if times are a little better, it can spread out a bit like that. And that's just, again, metaphorical type of bivariate distribution. Bivariate normal distribution is what that would look like. This one is a bit, oops, sorry about that, guys. This one is a bit more um, uh, uh, kurtotic than, than this one is. But the idea is that these things will change in size and shape. And that actually gives a hint as to what the policy needs to be to change them. And basically that policy needs to deal with all of the things that are here. There is a pathway out of this. There is a pathway to enlarging the geographic distribution that people have, which if these ideas hold, will have an ameliorative effect on transmission. But it's not a pathway that we're taking in Georgia at the moment. Maybe it will be taken in some time in the future or elsewhere. But I think the idea is that this type of macro effect really relates to the kinds of micro environments that we've been talking about and the ways in which those micro environments can be changed to create some different kind of overall social situation. Thank you. Questions or comments for Richard, please? So, um, area is defined as zip code. Yeah. There were five, five zip codes that were in the area. And so, then uh, risk would be uniform across the zip code in terms of the regression analysis? Well, <coughs> yes, uh, in general. I mean, not in terms of regression. We didn't do it as a regression uh -huh. analysis to look at the specific di but to look differences. But the risk by area yeah. would be uniform at the zip code level? Right, it would be fair. Well, actually, these are relatively well known small neighborhoods. And I think that just ethnographically, it can be said that they are. I've never actually done a, a, a sort of a linear regression type approach to see whether or not there is curvilinear. It probably would be. It's not perfectly linear distribution. But in general, the distributions there are similar. I guess my overall question is, um, the definition of neighborhood is defined by zip code, or were there geographic? Uh, zip code was a convenience. Okay. The definition of neighborhood is defined by people who live there. And there are all kinds of names, Fort Ward, Pittsburgh. You know, there are whole lots of different names for the neighborhoods that you won't find on the map. But these are people identify them as real neighborhoods. And those are smaller geographic units than the zip codes? They could be larger. Depends. Okay, but they're different from the yeah, zip Yeah, they're, yeah, they're, yeah. they're different. And of course, no data is conducted for those neighborhoods. There are states that have townships, mm -hmm. where I think Maine is one of them. Uh, that, where they do collect information on that level. What we really need is uh, information collection with no barriers. Yes. And with no administrative barriers. And uh, there is such a thing, actually, but it's, it's called the census. <laughs> and, uh, and we don't have access to it. You know, what you would like. <laughs> mm -hmm. yes. I've uh, beaten you into submission. <laughs> If you had to give advice to some young network scholars who are just starting their careers, uh, what would you tell them to do? What's the next thing, what's the next thing these guys should go out and do if, they're, if they want to end up where you are 20 years from now? Well, um, let, me, uh, uh, let me ask Nina, because she's doing something very similar to this, which I think is an excellent project. Maybe have you told people about what you're doing? <laughs> 
do it too. <laughs> <laughs> because this is, I think, critical. What she's doing is this critical amalgamation of viral dynamics or bacterial dynamics and human dynamics. And that's what she's really working on. Can you tell people about what you're doing? Hi. <laughs> 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 So that's a great example of how they can be used. There actually is a huge amount of data, some of which is available, some not. But um, it has the opportunity to work with the health department to be able to access this kind of information. And uh, it lies fallow otherwise. Nobody uses this. So there really is a, a tremendous amount of info, administrative information, which is how it's usually viewed, that can be put to use to try to understand how, how these networks work. All right, thank you so much.